After the breathless excitement of the last few years, we've suddenly hit a point where every second machine learning stolen content video on YouTube is about the sudden collapse of EV sales, where the mainstream and the less mainstream press is predicting the death of the EV transition, and where commentators are increasingly claiming that EVs have reached the extent of their market penetration and are now going to fade into obscurity because their batteries will die after two minutes or something like that. And of course, where the delight that is the YouTube comment section is filled with commenters singing the doom song. I gotta sing the doom song now! Doom 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 But is that really the case? Let's find out. So, last week at the time of filming, The Telegraph in the UK printed a delightful little ditty headlined Electric Car Sales Forecast Slashed as Drivers Turn to Secondhand Market, in which it commented that the UK's Society for Motor Manufacturers and Traders, known as SMMT, had cut its prediction for the percentage of new car sales that will be made up of electric vehicles. And just a few days ago, the Detroit Free Press ran an article headlined Auto Industry Faces Panic! Wild Uncertainty as US EV Adoption Lags Expectations! It shared that Tesla reported worse than expected performance with second quarter deliveries falling by 4.8% and reinforced the narrative that hybrids are perhaps a better option, pointing out that Ford's hybrid sales have increased by 56%. And in June of 2024, the European Automobile Manufacturers Association, the ACEA, stated that BEV market share in the EU dropped from 15.1% to 14.4%, despite a slight increase in car sales overall, and also reported a surge in hybrid sales. And as Nikki pointed out last week on 10, EV sales fell off a metaphorical cliff in Germany last month, leading to both cheers of joy from petrol heads and gear jammers from around the world smugly saying, See? Told you so! And introspective, panicked articles from industry insiders asking, But just what did we all do wrong? All of the above share the, to be honest, true, critique that a lot of markets lack a lot of affordable EVs, particularly as individual countries and the EU have started to put in place protectionist policies intended to quote unquote save their auto industries. This is a result of the oh no leopards ate my face experience of capitalism, where other countries have rather suddenly realised that China invested early and hard in EVs and they can now produce massive numbers of cars at much lower prices as a result. Basically, everywhere you look, you're facing a barrage of articles about how the EV transition has reached an inflection point. But not the positive hockey stick of adoption that we're used to seeing with technology. Instead, a sudden collapse which will leave EVs as a weird dead end in automotive evolution. Again. While everyone else will tool around in hybrids, rising sea levels and extreme weather events from climate change be damned. Sometimes they point to Mary Barra's comment in June that General Motors' electrification strategy is now expected to take, quote, decades. And I expect they'll soon start pointing to Musk's comment last night that the transition to clean energy could safely take place over the next century. Or as his weird friend commented, the next millennia. Yeah, absolutely. And I should probably say something about like, my views on you know, climate change yeah. and oil and gas, because uh, I think I probably different from what most people would assume. So it's, I don't think it's right to vilify the oil and gas industry. And I, and I, the world has a certain demand for oil and gas, and it's probably better if the United States provides that than, than some other countries. Sure. Um, sure. And, and it would help with prosperity in the US. And at, at the same time, obviously my, my view is we do over time want to move to a, a sustainable energy economy because eventually you do run out of, you run out of oil and gas. It's, it's not there for, it's not infinite. And there is some risk. I think it's not, it, the risk is not as high as a lot of people say it is with respect to global warming. But I think if you just keep increasing the possibility in, in the atmosphere enough, eventually it actually simply gets uncomfortable 
uncomfortable to to breathe. People don't realize this. If, the, if you go to, if you go past a thousand parts per million of CO two, you start getting headaches and nausea. And so we're, we're now in the sort of four hundred range. We're adding, I think, about roughly two parts per million per year. It still gives us. So what it means is we still have quite a bit of time. But so there's not. We don't need to. To rush. Contradicting all scientific evidence, which basically says it needs to have happened already, and to stop things getting, well, utterly terrible, the sooner we can manage it, the better. The Detroit Free Press article ends with a quote from Carl Bauer of iccars.com. Are they making a mistake going to all electric? My short answer is yes. Maybe not long term. Going all electric by 2050, I'd say that's a good goal. That's somewhat aggressive, but realistic. But 2030 is unrealistic foolishness and financially precarious, at best. It's a bad idea. It's going to cost you a lot. The realistic take is it will take you a lot longer than what people were originally thinking. At the weekend, automotive YouTuber Doug DeMuro ran a piece on his channel asking, are electric cars dead? And while the comment section is one we'd recommend you don't peruse, just like we'd recommend you don't peruse our comments section, the video fell back on some of the same tired old tropes about EV ownership that aren't the blockers to EV ownership that many people claim that they are. So is the news, and are those machine learning content farm videos right? Are EV sales in a significant decline? Have automakers bitten off more than they can chew with the EV transition? Well, the first question is, are EV sales actually in decline? Wait, I should rephrase that, because in order to answer that question, we should be asking an importantly different one. Are EV sales actually in decline as a percentage of total vehicle sales? Because it's important to look at sales figures as a chunk of the whole, not just the raw numbers. Why? Well, if there's a massive drop in car sales overall, maybe everyone suddenly started taking Tesla autopilot taxis. Or to pick something more likely to actually happen in the next decade, maybe the US suddenly invested heavily in public transportation and the number of people buying cars dropped dramatically. Then EV sales would be expected to drop, along with the rest of vehicle sales. So just to be clear, worldwide, EV sales are up. In early adopter markets, sales continue to be strong. In China, over half the vehicles sold in July were EVs. Nissan has even called it quits on its Qashqai compact SUV factory in Changzhou. It announced a plant closure and blamed falling sales due to China's price competitive EVs. And in Norway, BEVs made up nearly 92% of vehicle sales. To be fair to the doom mongers, plug-in sales did drop a whole 1.2% in the US in July, a shift that's largely due to decreasing sales of Tesla's vehicles. Tesla sales volume in Q2 dropped 6.3%, and as we've always understood would happen, they also dropped below 50% market share. Now, this isn't a case of me dunking on Tesla, although, to be fair, I might have done just a tiny little bit of musk dunking in this video. But I can hear someone... Ooh, no, I can hear lots of people typing right now about how much I hate Tesla and how I'm a real meanie about Elon in the comments. Yeah, look at those comments. Hmm. But this drop in market share is just a simple fact of other companies are producing EVs. And Tesla don't make vehicles that fit everyone's needs, nor do they make vehicles that fit everyone's tastes. It was always the case that eventually other automakers would start building decent EVs to compete. And when that happened, Tesla's market share would drop. It's not a slight against the company to understand markets. Although, as has been proven multiple times in the last few months, both corporate and private customers are looking elsewhere, perhaps because people continually posting videos and images to social media of their brand new cars having some significant quality control issues is not great publicity. And fleet managers, they don't like broken cars. But what really matters in the US sales figures is context. While Tesla's sales figures have fallen, other automakers have markedly improved. 
Kia's sales figures literally doubled year on year from January to July, largely driven by the popularity of its EV9 three-row SUV, a vehicle that's basically without competition in its market segment. Indeed, Kia's gleeful press releases and statements about EV sales show a degree of optimism from the automaker that pretty clearly says where they stand on the EV transition's impact on their business. Ford's EV sales rose by double digits in July, despite fewer SUV sales lowering growth. Interestingly, more than half of Mackey e and more than 60% of Lightning buyers are still brand conquests for them. Granted, for Ford and some other automakers, massively good finance deals being offered has helped push sales figures up. I mean, in a market where banks are offering even well-qualified buyers 5 or 6 or 7% interest rates at best, and automakers like Ford, GM, Kia, Tesla and many others are offering incredibly low interest rates on finance packages, it's going to help improve sales. But I'm going to come back to interest rates and financial uncertainty in a moment, so hold that thought. The degree to which consumers are willing to switch brands to get an EV should really be a wake-up call for the industry as a whole. GM also shifted a significant number of vehicles to the market, but its choice to discontinue the relatively cheap and cheerful Bolt with no equivalent replacement in its range has really hit sales hard, with GM's EV sales dropping a staggering 19%. And when you look further into the details, in Germany a very significant drop in sales followed the termination of the EV subsidy. And in France the higher income EV subsidy was cut, as was its low income leasing support subsidy. Why? Because it was too popular. We've also seen this play out multiple times here in the US, with state subsidies and rebates being paused because the funding allocated is woefully inadequate to meet actual demand. Incentives being dropped could be an entire video on itself, so let me know down below if you'd like us to compare, say, global fossil fuel subsidies to EV subsidies. Then we can see which ones are too popular. Alright, so the picture is actually really complicated. Sales are up in some places, kind of flat in others, and in some places mostly a little bit down, but in some other places quite down. Germany is a special case, it's pretty obvious why sales are down in places where the incentives have been reduced. But what about other areas? Affordability in general has a big part to play, as well as a dearth of affordable models in some markets. This is in part due to the fact that the US is late to the party when it comes to investment in electric vehicle manufacturing, as is Europe. Between 2009 and 2023, China invested more than $230 billion to develop its new energy vehicle manufacturing. Nearly half of that was in the past three years. It's allowed an enormous amount of research into technology and into cost savings, and given them a massive lead on just plain economies of scale. So the average price of an EV designed and built in China is around $34,000. The average cost of an EV in the US, $55,000. A figure that may well go up now we've lost the Chevrolet Bolt EV and have no equivalently cheap model to replace it. And that price differential is not just because of labour costs, it's because if you're building hundreds of thousands of EVs, the cost for the individual bits gets way cheaper. In the US we really didn't see that kind of investment until, well, pretty recently, and however you cut it, the US's investment in EVs is so far behind what the PRC has done. Now it is important, since we often get tediously incorrect comments in the YouTube mandated hate, I mean the YouTube mandated comment section, that the US has invested and subsidised its automotive industry plenty. Last year the US offered $12 billion in loans and grants just for quote unquote advanced vehicles. There's plenty of grants and subsidies that slip by, and states often offer significant tax breaks to automakers, which all amounts to nice little subsidies. 
Back in 2019, it was estimated that the G7 countries subsidized fossil fuels to the tune of $100 billion, and a huge chunk of that went towards subsidizing transportation costs, mostly for the private car. So yes, yeah, let's not get all high horsey about the auto industry in China being subsidized, eh? Or maybe, nay! There's also a lot of second guessing being done by the automotive market in the US when it comes to who will be in the White House on the 20th of January next year. I'm not going to explore the ins and outs of each campaign's attitudes towards EVs or any U-turns being done because of political donations and endorsements, because that would make us <laughs> political. But automakers are putting their shareholders before investments in future models in a politically uncertain time. The reasons for that I'll leave you to ponder in the shower. And then we have the financial markets. While Wall Street has had some truly incredible months of late and retirement accounts, savings accounts and wealthy trader types have benefited from record-breaking days after record-breaking days, inflation is still causing problems. The first way, interest rates. The cost of borrowing is high even if you're well qualified. Most banks and credit unions are offering 5-6% to as their absolute base rate for unsecured loans for things like cars. If your credit report isn't in the excellent category, you could see rates as high as 15%. Inflation is also affecting the cost of living too. Sure, it's cooling, and either by the time this goes out or perhaps shortly after, the US might get an official interest rate cut from the Federal Reserve. But because inflation is basically a measure of how quickly something is changing in value over time, even if inflation slows, things are still more expensive now than they were. The cost of living is still higher than it once was. Health insurance has soared in the last few years, and there are now more people without health insurance than we've seen for years. Even if your employer offers it, you're still, usually, expected to provide a portion of that premium out of your paycheck. And if you're finding it hard to pay bills elsewhere, you're going to have to make tough decisions. Why are bills so high? Mainly rent and utilities. Rents are massively more expensive than they once were, and it's now common to find people who were born in the 80s, 90s and aughts paying more for a rental than their older siblings are paying for a mortgage on a home three times the size. This is partly down to the fact that many places had temporary laws freezing rent at 2020 prices to help folks survive COVID-19, and those laws have now expired. But it's also down to the fact that during the COVID-19 rent freeze, we saw a massive increase in the number of institutional investors buying up property management companies and acquiring houses for sale to have an alternative revenue stream. And institutional investors that are now landlords don't care about your pay packet. They care about their return on investment. Also, a lot of the largely monopolized grocery companies used the cover of the pandemic to hike prices and rake in massive profits. That isn't just conjecture. They've admitted as much. I know people who are living hand to mouth, just existing, despite having a well-paying job. And yearly pay rises, they suck. Everyone from nurses to teachers and machinists to doctors are seeing pay rises that are between 1 and 5%, if they are actually getting a pay rise, which isn't keeping up with inflation. And then there are utilities. Nikki's local utility company put up the prices of its electricity by 18% in January, and just petitioned the local regulatory body to put them up by 10.9% next year. My own is asking for 7% next year, and nearly 10% the year after, and nearly 20% for its natural gas services. Sometimes the reason cited even for friendly local co-ops is that they need to invest in the grid to mitigate fire risks in summer, or to increase grid robustness. Many naysayers are eagerly blaming EVs for that, but as we've covered before, it's more often down to climate change, a history of poor maintenance and large corporations spending billions on AI server farms, which are sucking up the power. Well, they're certainly sucking. I may have gone into the weeds a bit there. I'll blame Nikki, she helped me with that last bit. But if you're struggling to afford rent, your utility bills are going up, and your last pay increase was barely more than a pizza party in the break room, you're not going to be spending money on a shiny new EV. 
especially when automakers are continually dumping affordable models for more expensive ones, and especially when automakers are keen to shift the models they make more profit on, i.e. their fossil burners. So they push those and they push deals on them even harder, add in some reticence from certain buyers to buy one particular EV brand that's previously been doing quite well, and we have a perfect storm which might lead to some significant shifts in the EV marketplace. So in answer to the question, have EV sales fallen off a cliff? No, not really. The same problems that we've had for a long time, a lack of affordable options, financing difficulties with more expensive models and poor availability are in the way the same as they always were. To be sure, things aren't as rosy as they were looking a little bit ago, but as always, context is queen. In large parts of the world, EV sales are higher than they've ever been thanks to continued incentives and policies that make EVs a smarter choice. In the parts of the world where fossil fuel subsidies are put ahead of EVs or where political disinformation is running rampant amid social networks whose owners are more interested in perceived slights than giving users the tools they need to accurately fact check, things are less rosy. As the song says, same as it ever was. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure that we can be 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Ockel Ward, John Le Pouvoir, World's Tallest Hobbit, John Hendricks, John Franks, Bill LaSalle, Bill Warren, Brian Curry, Amory Wong, Chris Foon, Stefan Tidy, Christian H, Mike Cooper, Casey Chapin, James Carter, Sam Yates, Kai Preshaw, Michael Ball, John Dunlop, Christian Rasmussen, Mark Bullock, Karen and Jude, Mike Whirl, and Daniel. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations, and we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. Address is also down below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below too. This month, we're talking about accessibility in our latest t-shirt design, and keep your eyes peeled for a new special t-shirt just for our trip to everything electric in Canada next month. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you've subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving!